just, I'm happy to be here and I'm very honored to do this. Uh, Latin elements are important. A little bit of a newer thing that folks are doing, but it's all, all about respect. It's Native American Heritage Month for those that didn't know. Uh, it's kicked off yesterday. We had a really good event uh, and we have a lot more coming this month. But uh, just like every culture, celebrate it every day. Don't just celebrate it for a month. Uh, you know, it, Heritage Months are beautiful, but celebrate who you are every single day, no matter what you are. Um, just part of my spiel. <laughs> so uh, we recognize that the campuses of uh, Cal State University of San Bernardino <laughs> each sit on the unceded indigenous and ancestral homelands. For San Bernardino, the land of the Gabrielino Tongo peoples, Chimuevi Nilu, Serrano Marayam, and the federally recognized land of the Aviatum of San Manuel Nation. For Palm Desert, the land of the Cahuilla, Ivili Wensum peoples, and the federally recognized land of the Agua Caliente band of Cahuilla Indians. We recognize that every member of the CSUSB community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we are responsible for acknowledging and making universities' relationship with indigenous peoples visible. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indians and indigenous peoples. This land acknowledgement has been developed by indigenous peoples with the oversight and approval of tribal elders from these respective tribes to ensure Native American indigen and indigenous collaboration in higher education. Thank you so much. So thank you again to Carlos for that beautiful land acknowledgement. Now, and now I would like to invite Dr. Liz Gunn, please, to introduce um, our students. <laughs> thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, and thank you guys all for coming. I am thrilled you are all here. Um, I would like to say really quickly, please silence your cell phones uh, and make everything's not be out loud. Um, and I am thrilled to be able to introduce Dr. Georgia Barker. She is our sixth W. Benson and Herrera Egyptology Scholar in Residence. Um, so we are very fortunate enough to have a rotating scholar position uh, now in our sixth year, and hopefully it will go come on for several more years to come. So for all of the students out there, that means that you get to learn from a different expert every single year to have a really special class um, that isn't really taught anywhere else. Uh, and so hopefully a number of you guys are taking advantage of it this year, and hopefully some of you will again next year too. Now, before joining CSUSB, Georgia Barker completed her Doctor of Philosophy and her postdoctoral research at Macquarie University in Australia, uh, in Sydney, actually. Um, and her research invest investigates the purpose and historical significance of funerary art from the ancient from ancient Egypt in the Old Kingdoms and Middle Kingdoms. So, you know, that's something like 2500 to about something like uh, 1700 BCE. And she's already published this very influential book um, on this matter. Um, and she's worked extensively in museum collections, including at Macquarie University History Museum, the Sydney Living Museums in Australia, as well as being a member of the British Museum Circulating Artifacts Project. And she's been an intern at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, she's also a member of the Australian Center of Egyptology's Expeditions at, at cemeteries of Mare and Beni Hassan in Middle Egypt. Um, and I'm really excited about her lecture today. So please welcome Dr. Parker. Thank you so much, Dr. Liska. It was a lovely introduction and it's so lovely to see you all today. So thank you so much for coming. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and to have the opportunity to talk to you about my research. Um, and so I'd like to thank the RAFMA staff for inviting me to speak today and for all of their work in organizing this event. Um, as Dr. Liska mentioned, I'm currently here at CSUSB as the W. Benson Hera Egyptology Scholar in Residence. So I'd like to just take this moment to acknowledge and thank Dr. Hera for his generosity, not only in funding this position, but also his support of Egyptology in this community. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Liska, who does all of the work in running and organizing this program. It's a real pleasure and privilege to learn from you and work with you. So thank you for your support and encouragement. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to be here. 
so while I am here, I am teaching a course that I've called Journey to the Beyond, which has taken the name from the Egyptian exhibition here at RAFMA. Um, I'm teaching a course that looks at ancient Egyptian art that's housed in museum collections. So there are a few of my students here, so thank you for coming. It's lovely to have you. Um, but what's really wonderful is that we have the opportunity to look at the objects themselves and the students are able to research and examine the objects, um, which is a really unique opportunity of being able to be here at CSUSB with the RAFMA collection. Uh, but today I'm going to speak to you about the results of my PhD research, which I completed at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. I did this work under the supervision of Professor Nagib Kanawadi, so I'd like to acknowledge and thank him for all of his support and encouragement. So my PhD research was focused on ancient Egyptian funerary art. So that is the art that was housed in ancient Egyptian tombs. Now, what's important to note is that art was not simply decoration in the tomb. It served very specific and practical functions. The ancient Egyptians believed that in the afterlife, they would require the same sustenance they enjoyed during life. And so it was essential for them to be able to prepare a tomb that would adequately provision them for eternity. Ideally, the living would continue to visit the tomb and present the desired offerings to the deceased, but the Egyptians feared and knew that this wouldn't always continue. So they implemented several safeguards in the construction and decoration of their tomb in an attempt to ensure that they would be eternally nourished and provisioned. One of these safeguards was artistic representations. It was believed that what was depicted would magically come into existence in the afterlife. So art was able to contribute to the deceased's eternal nourishment. There are a number of types of artwork that we find in ancient Egyptian tombs. And if you visited Rafma before, you may already be familiar with some of them as there are several on display in the Journey to the Beyond exhibition. But I'm gonna draw your attention to this group of figures on the left. You may or may not have noticed them before because they're pretty inconspicuous, but they would have originally been part of a larger group of models arranged on a baseboard. And that's what we call a funerary model. This is one of the types of artwork that I examined in my research. And I conducted a comparison between this type of representation and another type of funerary artwork that we call a wall scene. And you can see on the right, a fragment of a wall scene, which is also on display here at RAFMA. Uh, wall scenes have been quite extensively studied in scholarship. And because of that, we know a lot about the themes represented and their purpose and significance in the tomb but funerary models have not nearly received the same level of attention. And because of that, there are significant gaps in our understanding of the medium. So in my research, I aimed to obtain new insight into funerary models and what their purpose and significance was in the tomb. So to begin with today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of these two types of representations so that we're all on the same page before we dive into the deeper details. So firstly, turning to wall scenes. Wall scenes comprise two-dimensional representations that were painted and or carved in relief on the walls of the tomb. This form of fun funerary artwork became established early on in Egyptian history during what we refer to as the Third Dynasty, and it remained prevalent throughout the Pharaonic period. During the Old and Middle Kingdoms, the repertoire was primarily concerned with conveying so-called scenes of daily life. In these scenes, we see minor figures engaged in arrested movement as they conduct a wide range of activities that would have regularly occurred on earth, including agriculture, food preparation, industrial processes, marshland activities, bearers presenting offerings, among many others. And you can see a small selection of these themes here. It's likely that the scenes had sim some symbolic function to ensure the deceased's eternal rebirth in the afterlife, as well as serving as a form of provision. The scenes were typically positioned in the above ground part of the tomb, which is what we refer to as the tomb chapel. This area remained accessible to the living, and so it enabled wall scenes to be seen by visitors to the tomb. Funerary models comprise small three-dimensional sculptures that depict people and animals engaged in activities of everyday life. 
many of the themes represented by models are also found in wall scenes, such as agriculture, food preparation, industrial processes, riverine transport, and bearers presenting offerings. And you can see these themes are very similar to the ones that you just saw on the previous slide. The earliest examples we have are from the Old Kingdom in the 4th and 5th dynasties. And these consist of single figures fashioned of limestone who are most commonly engaged in tasks related to food preparation. The late 6th dynasty is when the typical funerary model appeared. At this time, the figures began to be fashioned of wood and arranged as groups on a single baseboard. The production of models reached its peak in the early Middle Kingdom. And this is when we have the greatest quantity, the greatest distribution across Egypt, and the greatest range of themes represented for the medium. But manufacture rapidly declined in the late Middle Kingdom, and by the New Kingdom period, funerary models had disappeared from elite funerary assemblages. So this is a much more restricted time period of usage than we have for wall scenes. The most common location for funerary models was in the subterranean burial chamber. In this location, they weren't seen by any of the living who came to visit the tomb. Instead, they were solely accessible to the deceased. The similarities in the themes represented by wall scenes and funerary models have regularly led scholars to label funerary models as duplicates or substitutes of wall scenes. So I have a small selection of quotes here from some of our leading scholars on Egyptian art to demonstrate this for you. So we have Taylor who notes that wall scenes were augmented by models. Schaefer writes that the content of wall scenes was transformed into three-dimensional form. Tiradridi states that models were a three-dimensional transposition of wall scenes. And Malik goes even further by labeling models three-dimensional equivalents of tomb scenes. And we have Thule, who was our leading scholar on models, and she asserts that they were designed to replace or supplement painted scenes. Now, the problem with these statements is not only do they overemphasize the similarities between funerary models and wall scenes, but they also create the assumption that funerary models fulfill the same purpose in the tomb as wall scenes. But only a comparative analysis between the two media can determine if this understanding is correct, but this had not yet been conducted. So I chose to undertake this work in my doctoral study in order to determine the precise relationship between funerary models and wall scenes and to gain a better understanding of the specific purpose of funerary models in the tomb. Now, for an effective and detailed comparison to be conducted on what is a very large corpus of material, certain parameters needed to be put into place. So I firstly achieved this through a restriction in the time period. So I focused on the late Old Kingdom to the end of the Middle Kingdom, which is roughly 2300 to 1700 BC. This is the period in which we have both wall scenes and funerary models in significant numbers. I also restricted the studies through the limiting the number of sites that I investigated. So I focused my project on the region of Middle Egypt, specifically the sites of Mea, Deir el Bersha, and Beni Hassan. Each of these cemeteries contains the tombs of the ruling elite of the province, as well as the burials of their family and the lower administrative officials. Middle Egypt experienced significant economic development during the late Old and Middle Kingdoms, and the tombs of the governors exhibit supreme wealth in their construction and decoration. This is particularly evident in their wall scenes. Middle Egypt also specialized in woodcraft during this period, which encouraged the production of numerous wooden items, including funerary models. Because of this, a rich body of both wall scenes and funerary models is preserved from the three sites, which allowed for a large corpus of sources to be collected and analyzed. The three cemeteries are also quite well documented, allowing for a relatively comprehensive corpus of sources to be obtained. Now, once I identified these sites as the focus of my analysis, I collected all of the known funerary models and wall scenes from the cemeteries. I categorized the representations according to the themes represented, and then I began to compare the themes one at a time. The comparison required a detailed examination of every representation. 
When analyzing each model and wall scene, I recorded all of the major and minor details of the representations. And you can see this list here lists some of the main areas that I was looking at. I also made careful note of the themes and motifs that are present in one medium, but absent from the other. Studying the representations in this level of detail enabled me to highlight some key differences between wall scenes and funerary models that had not previously been acknowledged. So today I'm going to show you some of the results of this comparative analysis by focusing on just three themes, bread making, offering bearers and cattle in procession. I'm going to highlight some of the main differences I identified for each theme and then reveal what these differences mean for our understanding of funerary models. So let's turn to the first theme, which is bread making. Bread was one of the staples of the ancient Egyptian diet, providing an essential form of nourishment. It supplied daily sustenance for the whole population and held a vital role in the economy. It also had an important role in death, forming one of the main items of the offering list and being deposited in the tomb as a funerary offering. So it's therefore not surprising that the production of bread holds an important place in the repertoires of both wall scenes and funerary models. In my study, I identified and examined a total of 31 models and eight wall scenes of bread making, demonstrating that it's a particularly popular theme for funerary models. Although no single artwork represents all of the stages involved in making bread, several of the most important stages are depicted by both media. What's especially notable is that bread making is the most expansive theme in the repertoire of funerary models in terms of the quantity of stages represented. Most themes in models are particularly condensed with often only a single activity representative of an entire process. So to demonstrate this for you, if we think of the theme of leatherwork, it's simply represented by one figure cutting the soles of sandals, which is the characteristic task of leather production. And this is very different from wall scenes, which portray multiple manufacturing tasks. And you can see in this scene, there is, they begin with the treatment of the hide and it continues all the way through to the production of the leather goods. So when we turn back to bread making, we can see that in models, it incorporates almost the full range of tasks that we see in wall scenes. And in this list here, you can see the bread making activities represented and almost all are portrayed by both media. <laughs> Within one single assemblage of funerary models, it's also common to find more than one of these tasks represented. This was achieved either through a collection of separate statues or as a combined group model. So this assemblage here is from the tomb of Nyank Pepikem at Mer, dated to the late sixth dynasty. And it's a combination of single or paired statues. All of these are depicted uh, portraying tasks related to bread making. So we have figures grinding grain on quern stones, kneading dough or shaping the dough into loaves and figures baking bread at an oven. Alternatively, they could be represented as a group on a single baseboard. And this model is from the tomb of Keti at Beni Hassan, dated to the Middle Kingdom. We can see there are the two women in the back left corner. They're grinding grain on quern stones. In front of them is a woman who's sieving the grain. Next to her is a man who's, who's beating grain with mortar and pestle. And then next to him is a woman who is baking bread at an oven. The popularity of bread making in funerary models isn't only witnessed in the quantity of sculptures and the range of tasks depicted, but also in the theme's prolonged appearance in the repertoire. The precursors to funerary models, which are those single limestone serving statues, they are mainly concerned with food preparation, and most of the figures are engaged in bread making tasks, with the most common motif of these early statuettes being a female miller grinding grain on a quernstone, which you can see an example of on the left here. In the late 6th dynasty, when the sculptures began to be fashioned of wood, several baking tasks were added to the repertoire. Bread making remained dominant throughout the period of the peak model production in the early Middle Kingdom. And even when model manufacture rapidly declined towards the end of the Middle Kingdom, there are still a few limestone sculptures of bread making known. So it's clear that the bread making theme holds an important and dominant place in the repertoire of funerary models. 
My comparison of the bread making theme also revealed some differences between the two media that can be attributed to their contrasting technical properties. So I'll provide you with a few examples of this by looking at just one motif, which is grinding grain on a quernstone. Both wall scenes and funerary models regularly portray two millers engaged in this task, although there are some differences in their arrangement. In wall scenes, the millers are consistently positioned opposite each other, with the ends of their querns sometimes making contact. And you can see this here in the scene of Aminem Hat on the right of your screen. As artists worked with a two-dimensional perspective, it's probable that this arrangement was a means for them to convey a side-by-side -side positioning without any of the figures or components being hidden from view. Alternatively, models could depict the millers in their actual side-by-side -side arrangement as they operated in a three-dimensional perspective. So in this model from the tomb of Henu at D.R. Bersha, the three millers are evenly spaced across the baseboard without any one being obscured from view. This holistic perspective of the three-dimensional medium also enabled the positioning of the miller's hands on top of the grinding stone to be clearly conveyed, as the models could offer a top-down view as well as a side view. In the model of Hanu, the miller's hands are placed evenly side by side on top of the stone, whereas in the wall scene of Aminem Hat, the artist has placed one of the miller's hands in front of the other so that both can be seen. These minute differences result from the contrasting technical properties of wall scenes and models and reveal that each design had to be created specifically according to the capabilities of that medium. The production of bread certainly holds a prime position among both wall scenes and funerary models, forming a vital source of nourishment for the tomb owner. Among the repertoire of funerary models though, bread making should be considered an essential thing. Models of bread making present a particularly expansive portrayal and remain prominent throughout the pharaonic period and throughout the period of model usage rather. It's likely that this significance of bread making in the model repertoire should be attributed to the location of the sculptures in the burial chamber. Here, they were positioned in close proximity to the deceased, so they could provide him with a perpetual source of nourishment in the afterlife. <laughs> So we're going to turn to our second theme for today, which is offering bearers. The representation of figures presenting offerings was particularly important as it provided the deceased with the necessary nourishment and supplies for the afterlife. In life, wealthy tomb owners established a mortuary cult that would ideally provide this, a perpetual supply of, of the desired offerings, but the maintenance of this cult couldn't be ensured. So representations of figures presenting offerings formed a vital safeguard. In both wall scenes and funerary models, there are two main aspects of this theme, the bearers themselves and the offerings they present. There are numerous examples of offering bearers known in both media, but there is a significant difference in quantity. <laughs> the presentation of offerings is a standard element of wall scenes, perhaps forming the most important theme in the tomb chapel. Almost all decorated tombs incorporate a variation of this theme and many feature multiple scenes of offering bearers. In my study, I identified examples of offering bearers on over 60 different walls of 22 tombs, totaling 63 scenes. While still popular in models, there are less examples known of offering bearers with only 31 identified in my study. Wall scenes also regularly devote a large amount of space to the theme. You can see this here in the largest scene of offering bearers that I studied, which includes 42 offering bearers spread across three registers. Such extensive display highlights the immense value of offering bearers in the repertoire of wall scenes. With more space dedicated to the theme, a greater number of offering bearers could be illustrated. Models, on the other hand, were typically more condensed in their representation of this theme, with often only a single bearer represented. This is the most common way of depicting the theme, with 22 of the 31 examples I examined comprising a single bearer. 
though, models could depict offering bearers in pairs with three examples identified in my study or as processions of three or more bearers of which I found the six examples. This is quite different from wall scenes where offering bearers are almost exclusively portrayed in long lines of procession. <laughs> And when considering the offerings that the bearers carry, there are a number of similarities between the two media. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, with all goods transported in models, also carried by bearers in wall scenes. However, wall scenes illustrate a much wider variety of goods. <coughs> this table here highlights some of the different offerings that I found among the representations, showing the more expansive range found in wall scenes. <coughs> Again, with more space dedicated to the theme, a greater variety of offerings could be portrayed. Of the goods transported by model offering bearers, by far the most common is a type of container. Most frequently a basket, but also boxes, chests, and a type of backpack. The basket is especially common for female offering bearers. These figures are character characteristically represented, supporting it on their head with a raised hand, with their other hand hanging by their side, either empty or grasping an additional item. Most often that would be a bird. In these bearers you see here from the tomb of Jehuti Nakta Dier al Bersha, each woman balances a basket on her head with the fingers of her left hand closing over the top and her right hand hangs empty by her side. Such baskets very rarely have their contents specified. <laughs> While the three-dimensional medium had the ability to depict hollow containers with the contents actually stored within, it's interesting to note that the majority of loads, like these ones here, are crafted as solid pieces. This suggests that it was a deliberate design choice. By depicting closed containers, I believe that the loads could be symbolic of all desired offerings. This was probably of particular importance for models which are quite condensed in their representation, allowing a single model offering bearer to encapsulate all of the desired provisions. In contrast, the contents of baskets and other containers in wall scenes are regularly specified. They often emerge from the top of the basket while being partially obscured by the side due to the two-dimensional perspective. And you can see an example of this here and the scene on the top right from the tomb of Pepiunk the Black and now. For the contents to be depicted in full view in the two-dimensional perspective, they were required to be lined across the top of the basket, which is found in the scene of Amenem Hat from Beni Hassan, which is displayed along the bottom. Alternatively, artists could use accompanying captions to identify the products stored within. This is done in the scene of the from the tomb of Bucket 3, which is that to the top left. It identifies the products obtained from the grape harvest, the bakehouse, and the brew house. It was presumably more important for the contents of containers to be specified in wall scenes, as they were displayed publicly in the location of the mortuary cult. The tomb owner may have used the illustrations to encourage the maintenance of his cult by the living, to proclaim his superior access to a wide range of offerings, and to specify the goods he most desired. Another difference in the offerings transported by bearers in wall scenes and funerary models is their portrayal of ritual elements. Wall scenes emphasize ritual through depicting bearers presenting a wide spectrum of ritual items and figures engaged in ceremonial activities. An example of this is seen here from the tomb of Neonk Pepikemet Mare, where five men performing the purification ceremony appear in the top register. The leading man in the second register burns incense, and below is a line of offering bearers presenting four legs and fowl, which were important cult offerings. All of the figures are oriented towards the tomb owner who is seated at the offering table. The processes of pouring libations and burning incense were integral to the rituals that were carried out in the cult area. So displaying them in wall scenes was essential as the representations were portrayed in the cult space and were viewed by the living who would hopefully carry out these rituals. In contrast, ritual items are rarely transported by model offering bearers. 
I identified only three models, which include HES vases and or sensors, which are important ritual items among the goods transported. And unlike wall scenes, the model bearers don't conduct rituals with them. They simply transport them. This difference in emphasis should be attributed to the location of models in the substructure. Ritual activity was not conducted in the burial chamber, which was sealed after interment. And so ritual items weren't an essential part of the repertoire of funerary models. This difference in ritual emphasis is further seen in the motif of the presentation of fowl. While both models and wall scenes portray offering bearers carrying fowl, wall scenes include the additional motif of bearers wringing the necks of birds. This task holds a prime position in wall scenes. It occurs very commonly. The bearer undertaking this task is often positioned at the head of the procession, and it's sometimes the eldest son of the two Mona who is specified. An example of this is seen here in the scene from the tomb of Pepiunk the Black at Mare, where seven of the 12 bearers are engaged in this task. Fowl forms one of the principal items um, of the mortuary cult, and the wringing of the neck comprised a key element in the associated rituals. The depiction of this motif in the public tomb chapel was important as this was where the living presented their offerings and performed the appropriate ceremonies. In the burial chamber, the importance of fowl was principally as a form of nourishment. And so representing the ritual action of wringing the neck wouldn't have been considered essential in this location and for models. Instead, model offering bearers simply carry fowl, usually in the hanging right hand, as you can see in this model from the tomb of Ippi at Beni Hassan. As the models were concealed from view, they didn't participate in the cult and its ritual activities that were celebrated by the living. <clears throat> While the offering bearer theme holds an important place in the repertoires of both wall scenes and funerary models, there is a clear difference in emphasis and, promise, and prominence. Wall scenes dedicated more space to the theme and so illustrated a greater number of bearers and range of offerings. They also exhibit a ritual emphasis, which was essential for their location in the public cult chapel. Models, on the other hand, were typically more condensed with often a single figure encompassing the entire theme. The offerings transported are often unspecified, so they could be symbolic of all desired goods. But when designated, they focus on essential foodstuffs rather than ritual items. In this way, they were better equipped to nourish the tomb owner in the afterlife. So turning to our third theme for today, which is cattle in procession. Cattle formed a vital part of the ancient Egyptian economy due to the esteemed value of their products and services. They were the most highly valued domestic animal. Only the highest elite could afford a herd of cattle, and so representations of cattle in procession convey the superior status and wealth of tomb owners. In my study, I identified scenes of cattle in procession on over 35 different walls of 21 tombs, totaling 40 wall scenes. This high number is perhaps not surprising considering the fact that the scenes were displayed in the public part of the tomb, allowing this proclamation of the tomb owner's status and wealth to be admired by visitors. But the same situation isn't found in funerary models, with only five examples of cattle in procession identified in my study. This difference in prominence is also seen in the sizes of the herds represented. Wall scenes illustrate grand herds with some featuring exceptional numbers of cattle. What, one particularly large herd is seen here in the scene from the tomb of Jehuti Hotep at Deir el Bersha, where three groups of calves are displayed in the upper register, a procession of five oxen in the middle register, and a very large herd of over 60 cattle in the lowest register. Grand herd sizes were especially important in wall scenes as they visually expressed the tomb owner's superior status to any visitors to the tomb. In contrast, funerary models don't display grand herd sizes. Each model procession that I examined comprises only one or two oxen. 
such a vastly restricted number of cattle should most likely be attributed to the location of models in the burial chamber. Here, the models were concealed from view and so couldn't contribute to the public proclamation of the tomb owner's wealth and status, and so large herds were unnecessary. Instead, models were only accessible to the deceased, and so one or two oxen may have been considered sufficient to provide the cattle's desired products and services. There are also differences between wall scenes and funerary models in how they arrange the herds of cattle. And this again can be attributed to their contrasting technical properties. Working in three dimensions, models could position the animals in any location on the baseboard without anyone being hidden from view. In this example from D.R.L. Bersha, the two cattle stand side by side and both remain fully visible. Wall scenes, on the other hand, were restricted to a two-dimensional perspective that prevented this same realistic arrangement. The animals are depicted in profile, and if they were to be positioned side by side like in models, then only the one nearest to the viewer would be seen. Artists use different methods to overcome this absence of depth, with one of the most common being lateral layering, which involves closely overlapping the body of one animal with that of the next, as you can see in this example here from the tomb of Keti at Beni Hassan. This arrangement clearly conveys that the herd advances beside one another rather than in single file. In order to distinguish each animal in this technique, the decoration of the hide is alternated. In this scene, the colors and patterns of the hides swap between light and dark shades and spotted and plain decoration. There are a number of differences in the representation of cattle and procession between funerary models and wall scenes, which can be attributed to their contrasting technical properties, as well as their different locations in the tomb. The theme was of particular importance in wall scenes, as these representations were displayed in the public part of the tomb. So they could contribute, they could proclaim the wealth and status of the tomb owner to any visitors. <coughs> Elements of grandeur like large herds of cattle in procession, were appropriate for these designs. Models, on the other hand, were concealed in the burial chamber, causing them to solely serve the deceased and not interact with the living. Representations of cattle in procession weren't as important in this location, so the theme should be understood as supplementary in the repertoire of funerary models, being only included among more expansive model assemblages. So in looking at just these three themes today, we can see that there are differences in the level of importance of each theme to funerary models and wall scenes, as well as how each theme and motif were represented by the two media. Some themes like bread making are essential for funerary models as they offer necessary nourishment for the deceased's afterlife. Others like offering bearers were also important for models, but presented a different emphasis to wall scenes, which was more appropriate for their location in the burial chamber. And some, like cattle in procession, don't hold the same prominence as they do in wall scenes and should be considered supplementary. <coughs> when considering these themes among the full corpus I examined in my study, we can see certain themes that predominate among models. In particular, granaries, bread making, brewing beer, boats, and offering bearers are the most commonly attested. Each of these themes contains a high number of examples among the corpus, showing their importance to the repertoire. <coughs> what is common about these themes is that they all portray and offer products and services that would be of great benefit to the deceased's well-being in the afterlife. Granaries offer a supply of grain for nourishment. Bread making and brewing beer offer the staples of the diet. Boats provide riverine transport and offering bearers transport the desired goods. These themes are all about provision. With their location in the burial chamber, funerary models were solely accessible to the deceased. This close association with the body presents a direct connection between the services offered by models and the tumor in his afterlife. 
The emphasis on providing essential commodities and services witnessed in the repertoire of funerary models reveals the medium's primary role in the tomb, which was to provision the deceased for eternity. This is in contrast to wall scenes, where apart from offering bearers, these themes are not as commonly attested. <clears throat> While wall scenes also contributed to the deceased's sustenance in the afterlife, with their location in the public tomb chapel, they had the additional function of publicly proclaiming the superior status, wealth, and achievements of the tomb owner to any visitors to the tomb. This interaction with the living was an essential function of the chapel, causing the repertoire of wall scenes to be specifically designed and selected to impress visitors and presumably encourage them to present offerings. This is further witnessed in some of the themes that can be considered essential in the repertoire of wall scenes, but are entirely absent from the repertoire of funerary models. Most notably, these are the themes that involve the person of the tomb owner. The figure of the tomb owner dominates wall scenes, being depicted multiple times in the chapel, displayed at a grand scale, and with most activities organized around his figure. Although the quantity and repertoire of these scenes varies between tombs, the tomb owner consistently forms the central figure of the representations. The tomb owner is usually portrayed in one of two roles, as a passive figure overseeing the work of his estate, or as an active figure directly engaged in certain activities. In both types of scenes, he is clearly distinguished from the other figures represented through his appearance, attire, posture, and scale. <laughs> As a passive figure, the tomb owner is typically positioned at one end of a series of registers which depict minor figures engaged in everyday life tasks. He faces towards them, though is frequently separated by a vertical ma'ar inscription that states he is viewing their work. In this scene from the tomb of Pepeyank the Black at Mare, the tomb owner is viewing agricultural activities, fishing and fowling, and other marshland activities. And you can see the vertical ma'ar inscription that separates him from them. As an active figure, the tomb owner is principally engaged in three main types of hunting activities. Spearfishing, fowling with a throw stick, and hunting in the desert. In each of these activities, the tomb owner acts as the central protagonist. He is directly engaged in the hunt and is always successful in his endeavor. The hunting scenes commemorate the tomb owner as a person of high status and express his contribution to the triumph of order over chaos, which was central to the Egyptian conception of the world. Another scene in which the tomb owner assumes a central role is the offering table scene. In its characteristic form, it comprises the two owner seated before a table piled with offerings, but the theme is regularly expanded with additional motifs, such as priests performing ceremonies, offering bearers transporting goods, and an offering list, like you can see in this scene from the tomb of Nyank Pepikem at Mea. <laughs> Depicting the offering table scene in the tomb chapel conveyed the tomb owner as the primary recipient of the goods presented by the living, and his desire for this provision to continue perpetually. These themes that involve the tomb owner's active participation are completely excluded from the repertoire of funerary models. There are no known models of the tomb owner spearfishing or fowling, there are no models of the desert hunt, and while there are models of offering bearers, there are none of the tomb owners seated at the offering table. The tomb owner as a passive figure also rarely appears among funerary models. Instead, models concentrate on the productive tasks of minor figures. It seems that one of the main reasons for this difference in representation is the contrasting locations of the tomb media in the tomb. Funerary models being housed in the burial chamber accompany the body of the deceased. He could directly view the activities being performed, and so there was no need to represent him among the sculptures. It's notable that one of the most popular locations for funerary models in the burial chamber is beside the coffin, next to the eye panel decoration, allowing the tomb owner to directly view the activities. <laughs> it was therefore not necessary to represent the tomb owner as a passive figure in funerary models, as he was physically present with the sculptures. 
A location in the burial chamber also meant that models did not interact with the living and so didn't have a role to play in attracting and impressing visitors to the tomb. Representations of the tomb owner as an active figure were therefore not essential among models either. So my comparative analysis revealed several distinguishing details between funerary models and wall scenes that had not previously been acknowledged in scholarship. Close examination of the repertoires of both media has shown that the representation that the themes represented by models were specifically selected according to the medium's role in the tomb, rather than simply duplicating the repertoire of wall scenes. The themes and motifs most commonly attested in the model corpus are those that provide the products and services of greatest benefit to the deceased's eternal well-being. Representations of food preparation and transport are particularly prevalent and can therefore be considered essential to the model repertoire. Themes that convey products and services considered desirable rather than essential appear infrequently and are usually confined to more expansive model assemblages, such as animal husbandry and industrial processes. In addition to the different levels of importance of th certain themes among funerary models, there is the noticeable absence of the essential themes among wall scenes, most notably those involving the person of the tomb owner. This is a clear contrast between the two media and reveals that there is a difference in purpose and that a unique repertoire was selected specifically for funerary models. <laughs> for the themes that are represented by both media, we also see differences in the minor details, which can be attributed to the contrasting technical properties of wall scenes and funerary models. <laughs> Artists could only work within the capabilities of their specific medium, and we can see the designs were created specifically according to those properties. And this created some noticeable differences in design. So my research has shown that funerary models shouldn't be understood as duplicates or substitutes of wall scenes, as scholarship has previously presumed. Funerary models had their own distinctive repertoire and their own unique designs, which were created according to their specific purpose in the tomb and their unique technical properties. Being located in the burial chamber, funerary models were exclusively accessible to the deceased and couldn't be seen by the living. This close association with the body presents a direct connection between the services offered by funerary models and the tomb owner's afterlife. The emphasis on provision that is seen in the repertoire of funerary models can be explained as being essential for the medium to fulfill its specific function in the tomb successfully. So funerary models should be understood as a distinct type of representation that was specifically conceived to provision the deceased for eternity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, would you be willing to take some questions? Of course. So, mm. You might need to also repeat the question for the people. Sure. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, two quick questions. One is a very surface question. Hollywood is fascinated with the mummies and falses, but when those folks are made, where does the time spent on the daily life to really add character? You know, why is that? The second question is Queen uh, had shut up was uh known as a very important pharaoh, only female. Uh, in her uh, tomb, what did these things um done to prepare for the life of her to in your service? Sure. The first question is about why movies in Hollywood focus on, um, I guess, the funerary sphere rather than everyday life. Uh, I think probably to answer that is partially because of the evidence, most of the evidence that we have surviving comes from a funerary context. Um, the Egyptians created tombs that would la ideally last for eternity, whereas their everyday structures weren't made from the same durable materials and so on the whole haven't survived as well. 
So a lot of our evidence is surviving from a funerary context, which is probably why it receives more attention. And I imagine the kind of the ideas of the Egyptian belief of the afterlife is probably quite exciting for Hollywood to pursue further. So I imagine that's also why this is something they're interested in. Um, your second question was about Hatshepsut and whether she also had models in the tomb. Uh, no, there's she's from the New Kingdom period. And by that time, models had disappeared from tomb assemblages. We do know that models were included in royal tombs, but because most of the tombs were plundered or destroyed, we have very little surviving examples from royal tombs of that time. By the New Kingdom, models had changed entirely. We have some from the tomb of Tutankhamun, but they're quite different from these examples here. They're principally boats and they don't have any figures represented. So it's quite a different type of funerary artwork. So New Kingdom mostly don't have anything like this. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, question. Henry, yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure. The way that the figures look, were the arms uh, positionable? And yeah, they, they are like separate pieces that were on a joint or something. The arms are most commonly fashioned as a separate piece of wood and were attached with a dowel. So they can be moved into different positions. Yes. Depending on the quality of the model also impacts how much that, um, that occurred. Yeah. Yeah, question. Brian? Do we find any personal names on the models? Uh, is that one thing about the tube scenes that stands out a little bit more than real that everybody, including the dialogue, uh, is trying to give this sense of like they're actually people that they can not yeah, the question is about the use of inscriptions and whether the individuals on models are named. Most models are anonymous. Very rarely are there inscriptions on models. When they occur, they're usually in granaries and it's naming the type of grain that's being stored. Um, occasionally they're on models of offering bearers or boats, it's most often the name of the tomb owner, not the names of the individuals. We have a small number of examples where the figures are actually identified by name, which possibly indicates that more of them were understood to be real people, even if they weren't identified by such on an inscription, um, but mostly they're, they're unnamed. Yeah. Yeah. Another question? Comment. Yeah. Um, it makes very quite other period I'm more interested in that be <laughs> the burial chamber, but the thing that I find is going on in the burial chamber uh, is that there is really an emphasis on repeating the process of the modification of uh, the uh, They're representing the process and they use statues for that. And, and in, in those cases, it's very clear. They're focused on kind of putting the deceased body in the hand of the mind of like the Osiris, or just like we evolved in order to do that, that process. Yet, I really like how they found a similar thing that I think in uh, earlier evidence. But I would say that then that supports the idea that what's going on really is a perpetual ritual can't find that these aren't just people who are token mm -hmm. to the, the standards to their for eternity. Um, yes, I agree. <laughs> In summary, <laughs> yeah, any other questions? Yeah, Moises. So I forgot to note down which model it was, but um, one of the funerary models had a depiction of men and women working together to make bread, beer, and I noticed um, a lot of new bread making steps show up during. Uh, um, funerary models as opposed to wall scenes, but what limitations do wall scenes have that they couldn't have been bread making before? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't quite know what you mean. What do you mean they couldn't depict it before? Uh, when the chart was brought up showing the differences between what was depicted on funerary models and wall scenes, and uh, the steps in bread making was shown, yeah, with uh, funerary scene, with funerary models, you see a lot of like. They'll put bread into olds and other things like that that are not put in wall scenes. So what's the difference in how they make wall scenes that makes it so they can't depict stuff like that? Or is it just that we haven't found anything that depicts um Bread and things like that. We do see scenes that do represent the, all those different aspects of bread making as well. So basically the, all that we see in funerary models is also found in wall scenes and all of those steps. So there are scenes and I didn't give many examples of today, but there are scenes that show the different molds used to make bread and the different methods of baking. Um, it looks a little bit different because of the three-dimensional perspective and the two-dimensional perspective. Um, but bread making is appears earlier or a similar time as it does in funerary models, but continues long after in wall scenes. Yeah. 
Yes. I'm really surprised that the in the bread making seems you the men and women working together. Mm -hmm. Is that can you say a little bit about what that really represents in that practice and whether there are any differences between the models and the drawings in terms of gender balance or yeah, the questions about the role of men and women, particularly in bread making, which you did notice it's one of the activities that women are involved in. Um, it's it's actually similar in both funerary models and wall scenes in terms of gender distribution. There are particular roles in society that men would perform and particular roles that women would perform. Bread making is one of the themes that women are heavily involved with. They're shown grinding grain, sieving grain and um baking bread, whereas the men are shown pounding grain with mortar and pestle, and they're shown in straining beer, which is kind of the later stage once you have the bread and turn it into beer. They're shown in very specific tasks, which indicates that that was probably the distribution of work in life. We see that across both wall scenes and funerary models. Um, Another task we see, we see women as offering bearers um, in funerary models more commonly if we see women than men, whereas in offering bearers in wall scenes more commonly we see men than women, but we do see both. Um, but another task that women commonly appear in is spinning and weaving. Um, that's a task that women performs during this period and both wall scenes and funerary models convey that. So it seems mostly it's a reflection of every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So One more time. We have a comment from our Zoom. Sure. He says, "Thank you, Georgia. When I visited Egypt a few years ago, he noted the uh, we noted that bread making was still an essential everyday task for men." No, it's just a yeah, definitely. You see a lot of bread making um, in Egypt everywhere you go. Um, it's delicious bread. So <laughs> would definitely recommend. <laughs> uh, yeah, questions? Oh, Carlos? Yeah. So that the king was Sorry, I didn't quite hear you. What did you say? Uh, you said in the funerary models that the king was sometimes really different. Oh, the tumor now. Nah. Yes. Yes. Under this context, what they need in the yeah, good question. There's only a small number of examples we see the tomb owner represented. Uh, most commonly, it's in boat models. Um, sometimes it, the tomb owner is symbolized by his coffin on a funerary boat model. Um, and sometimes they're a representation of his, of his living figure represented on a boat. Um, and then only in a couple of other instances do we have him represented. There's one known of a cattle count um, where there's lots of cattle being aligned and the tomb owner is represented overseeing that. Um, and there's one one known of like an entertainment representation where the two men are seated and there's musicians performing in front of him. Um, but that's that's about it. It's pretty rare. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, question. Can I hear it? What type of wood do they use? Yeah, the wood is interesting. Um, I I think this is an area of study that needs more work. It would be great to have some more scientific analysis done to look at the wood. But we notice different types of wood. Most of it seems to be local Egyptian wood. And in a lot of cases, it actually seems like the wood was reused. So we can see on the baseboards of models, sometimes dowel holes um, and other markings that indicate the wood was used for something else originally and then was recycled to use for a funerary model. Um, in cases of finer quality models, we do sometimes see imported woods. Um, so a nicer wood was brought in in wealthier circumstances. But I think there's more work that's needed to be done on, on looking at wood and possibilities of trade that occurred around the production of funerary models. Yeah. Yeah, Daniel. Um, is there any like evidence of them, these figures actually uh, uh, like possessing like an ox spirit and to like accompany the cop to and from the Netherlands? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Okay, is there any like evidence of them actually having like a um, spirit? You know, like an ox spirit, right? Yep. Spirit uh, assigned to them and to where they travel with the spirit to call the king back and forth between the and yeah, I think it's an interesting question. It comes down to whether these figures are representing known individuals or not. I think mostly they're described by scholars as being anonymous workers. So if they weren't actually representative of someone, then they wouldn't function as a cast statue like one of a tomb owner or an elite person would. Um, but there is a possibility that they do represent known individuals, especially in the small number of examples that are inscribed. So I think there is a possibility that they could have functioned in that way. Um, but it's we don't have any written evidence around funerary models and whether what their purpose was in that way and whether they did function in that. So it's just based on our interpretation. So it's possible, but um, seems less likely than the formal statues we find. Yeah, I think that was like the question was like, do they have a spirit that travels or that they figure? 
I think that's an unanswerable question to really know. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, I mean, they were able to function in the afterlife, so were able to continue working, but whether or not they had a particular or representative of a particular person is something that needs more work to be able to determine. I think it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Last question, Henry. Yeah. So outside of just Walmart, was there anything that came after the funeral figures that replaced their function, if you will? Yeah, funerary models come to an end at about the same time that the Shabti appears. So I think there's correlation there. Our earliest examples of Shabtis come from around the Middle Kingdom period. Um, and it looks like there's a slight shift in religious belief and what they wanted these kind of three-dimensional figures to function for them in the afterlife. And there's a shift more towards labor and agricultural labor than what these funerary models were designed. So I think it's um, partly a shift in religious belief, but it's also at the same time funerary models disappear around the time when the provinces were no longer being governed by the administrators within the provinces. The administrators went back to the capital. So there's also some administrative and economic changes around that time too, which may have influenced the ends of, of funerary models. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, so I just wanted to thank Dr. Martin <laughs> once again for coming today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And before all you go, I do encourage you, if this is your first time here, please look at the museum. It is really a spectacular place. Come back, come back with your friends, come back with your family, although you are closing at six, right? But <laughs> another day. It's like, it is a really cool place. Uh, there is a spectacular and different uh, selection of objects there, the journey to the beyond. But there's also a variety of rotating exhibitions. So there's always something new on at the museum. And I do recommend that you come back here as often as possible, become a friend of the museum um, and all the things that we'll do. So thank you so much for coming out today. Um, is there another event coming up soon, Ashley? Uh, we have a public lecture again um, for Linda Vallejo, one of our artists that is um, currently displayed. And if you guys are on your way out of that little room, uh, she's had her public lecture on November 16th. Please come back. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs>